some some issues with it. So let's see if it it allows me. Um, but I'm so excited to be talking with you today about TreeSnap. Uh, it's a great app that we've developed um, myself and Meg Staten, who's also on the line uh, today. And so hopefully we can give you kind of a quick introduction to that as well as um, answer any questions you have. So can you see my screen now? Yes. Perfect, great. Um, so our goals with TreeSnap is uh, to facilitate connection to citizen scientists for research on tree species, particularly those that are threatened by invasive insects and diseases. Um, so I think it fits well with some of what you're talking about. And when it comes to the who, TreeSnap is really focused on those who are passionate about trees and the scientists who are researching them. So unlike some other citizen science apps out there that are fantastic and I use all the time in a variety of contexts, TreeSnap is really geared towards um, those more trained users, as well as scientific research that's directly engaging those users or citizen scientists and applying the research. So we have two kind of parameters that need to be met for a project to be included in TreeSnap. And basically that's that there's a combination of active research projects. So people are collecting data and they're implementing it and they're using it. Um, and then that they're engaging citizen scientists and the public in their work. I think those two are the combination for success in TreeSnap. Um, and it's less useful in the context where you have an idea and you want people to contribute to it, but it's not going to be driven by that um, uh, kind of gr uh, ground level support. Um, but uh, I think it does a lot. So what is TreeSnap? So it's got two major components. It has a mobile app that's used for submitting observations of uh, trees with important characteristics that you're interested in. And I'll walk you through that. Um, it also collects your location. It asks people to answer a few core questions regarding those trees. Those questions are all provided to us by the scientist partners that we're working with um, or whatever groups are doing that research. Uh, so we have kind of three different classes of um, user types in TreeSnap. So some of my terminology is based on that, um, just the general users, uh, the scientists who have access to the exact locations of things, and then the administrative level. So um, if I'm referring to scientists, you know, it's a pretty broad category. Um, so that's the app side of things. I will say that it works fine offline for remote data collection. That's really important for a lot of our user groups. I know we had someone testing it deep in the Amazon, and um, I use it all the time where there's no internet and it works fine. You can just upload things afterwards. But then there's the whole website side of things. So the website is uh, where you would do a lot of your data curation and the downstream stuff. So the app is for collecting the observations and the website is for everything that comes next. So you can keep track of your observations and share them with others. You can have different levels of user permissions. Um, so I was just mentioning kind of the scientist user level. Um, if you're in charge of a project, you can make the people on your team, give them access to see those exact locations so that they can follow up on them, visit them. Um, scientists can organize and curate data collections and easily batch download anything. And um, like I said, there's a fantastic team working on this. So I think we've had a lot of success uh, when there's been some challenge there or something that someone wanted to do that we weren't quite equipped to do, being able to meet that. Scientists can also reach out to the citizen scientists that they're working with and ask for more information. Uh, we've been really careful about uh, data privacy um, in terms of you might not have their exact email address, but you can message them within the website. It will send uh, something to their email. Let's say you want a sample of that. You want to follow up on that tree to see if it really uh, was that American chestnut or if it um, has seeds, you want to collect those seeds. Um, so that's a way to do that and um, uh, have it uh, be set up in a way that's both enables scientists to do what they want to do as well as protecting the privacy of those who are using the app. Um, so the team on TreeSnap is uh, myself, Bert Abbott, and Dana Nelson. So it's um, University of Kentucky, U.S. Forest Service, and Forest Health Center on the content side of things. So we're all uh, tree people and uh, interested in, um, you know, the implementation of that. And then Meg Staten, Abdullah Al-Saeed um, at the University of Tennessee. 
And uh, I think this has been a fantastic combination because Meg and Abdullah are uh, really phenomenal when it comes to how to handle that data and how to create something in a user-friendly way. And they're great to work with. Uh, so uh, and I'm sure she could answer your questions on the technical side of things that will be beyond me uh, for today's talk. Um, but it was funded with a grant from the National Science Foundation's Plant Genome Research Program. Uh, because of this, uh, up until now, TreeSnap has been free to people who want to use it, of course, citizen scientists. But also, if you want to add a tree, um, there's no additional cost to that. Um, the only time there might be costs associated with something is if there's going to be a major change to the app, um, you know, something that's going to add a feature that would take a lot of time to imp implement. But otherwise, um, it's uh, free and um, a pretty quick process. So we have a lot of current projects and partners. This is just a subset. Um, we have many other trees uh, and projects, but things like ash for emerald ash borer, American chestnut uh, for chestnut blight, uh, hemlock for hemlock lady adelgid, elm for Dutch elm disease. Um, and then we also have some other trees like white oak. There's nothing really um, wiping out white oak right now, but we are partnered with a breeding program that's looking at the genetic diversity of white oak across its range. Um, you know, what does that look like? What can we learn about it? Can we better prepare for the future? And um, TreeSnap really relies on these partners because TreeSnap's a platform and you can use it however you want. Um, so it's up to those scientists and those um, uh, outreach specialists and people on the ground to take it and use it uh, as makes sense for them. So I'll give you some examples of that. This is from one of our uh, kind of, I think, most successful partnerships with the American Chestnut Foundation. Uh, so they've been using TreeSnap for some time to streamline the process through which they report new American chestnuts. So you can see this is their paper form that used to be the, the kind of standard. Um, and you can still use, I believe, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, if, if anyone knows, but uh, you can see it's kind of long. This is only part of it. Um, there's a lot to fill out and there's a lot that people could either leave blank or get wrong. Um, and they also have to submit a sample, a leaf and twig sample. So there's many different steps to that that could result in some problems. So what we did is we worked with them and we talked with them about their needs uh, to develop the American Chestnut portion of the Tree Snap app. So basically you can choose a tree. Uh, this is as the app looks as I open it up. Um, and you can see the ones listed here are the ones that are relevant in my area. You can also click to show all of them, but we think that makes it a little easier for people. And let's say it's American Chestnut. So then you record tree location and characteristics as specified by partners. So all of these questions were questions that our, uh, the American Chestnut Foundation really wanted to know about. Things like um, taking a photo of it to try to distinguish it from some lookalikes. Does it have nuts or burrs? Does it have catkins? Um, you know, is it planted versus wild? So they could distinguish some of those in their own research program. Does it have symptoms of chestnut blight? Um, and then it will automatically, uh, during all of this, be taking your uh, location. Now you can manually input your GPS location, um, or it can uh, connect via Bluetooth to an external device if you've got something that's very precise. Um, but overall, we've had really good success with that and think the location, it's usually um, within five to 10 meters. So we also have a section for added information. So things like uh, ID photos of chestnut, um, its distribution, more information about the process of submitting a twig sample to the American Chestnut Foundation um, along with your observation. So just to kind of walk you through that uh, real time using the app, um, hopefully you can see this video that's playing and I'll open up uh, one of the species as if I'm gonna submit an observation to Chestnut and you can see right there, you know, some of the different things that it wants you to record. Um, as well as the information um, identification photos uh, to help people along. Now, TreeSnap is intended for that kind of more technical user group that's probably going to know what American Chestnut looks like, um, and it doesn't do any automatic identification for you, but we still wanted to provide some of that. So another example with White Oak, uh, you can see that information, and with Ash, we've worked a lot uh, with um, the U.S. Forest Service on some questions having to do with Ash, and you can see the kinds of things that they were interested in. Uh, canopy condition resulting in educational material to help guide people in their submission. You can also see your observations, what you recorded, and look at them on a map. So some people have told me that helps them navigate back to their observations. 
Uh, they can find them again easily in the field if they don't have some kind of other uh, GIS device. Um, and on the app, again, the primary goal is data collection. So you're really looking at your data um, and it's a way to submit that data. But the website is what we intend people to use for everything downstream of that. So here's our website, treesnap.org. If you sign in, or even if you don't, you'll be able to see uh, lots of locations, um, your locations, uh, as well as other people's. So this is, these are my locations, or uh, uh, general locations for American chestnut. Um, and you can kind of uh, sort them by different species as you like. Um, you can also see other people's observations. Uh, so if you're not logged in as a scientist, what you're going to see are their fuzzy locations. Um, so it's not going to give you exact location. We want to preserve um, the privacy of the locations of those trees to the general public. Some of them are really high value, and we don't want to increase any risk of um, timber theft or uh, increased visit, especially if they're on private property. Um, but uh, if you're a scientist, you can see the exact location of all of the uh, observations. So. Um, then partnering scientists can curate data and manage sampling teams. So I'll show you a few of the things you can do with that, but you can see the dashboard, you can see who's been doing what, you can advance filter options. So let's say you're only interested in American chestnuts that were collected in Kentucky that um, look really healthy. You can set up a filter for that and be notified via email anytime someone submits something with those characteristics that you're interested in. So to walk you through that, just a little bit more on the website side of things. Um, I'll show you a video of that. So here I am looking at observations um, and these are my observations and you can look at them up close. You could share them with other people. Um, you can uh, add them to a collection or just download them. Uh, so let me show you those collections because I think they're especially useful. So uh, you can click on those. You can see trees that you've added to them. Um, and then you can batch download all of that as um, a couple different formats. And if you need something different, well, we're really flexible on making that happen. You can also have groups of people that you collect with. So um, you can see there uh, the uh, nature sanctuary that I work with a lot has a group uh, where they collect data on the ash trees that they're monitoring for a lingering ash project. Um, and with that, everyone in the group can see each other's observations. So they don't have to have any special type of access. They can all be contributing together. Um, so that's another um, thing that we added to try to make this um, more user friendly. So with that, um, right now, TreeSnap is at uh, 6,708 registered users, a little bit over 7,000 recorded observations. Um, while these have been done all over the globe, the vast majority are kind of in the eastern United States. I'm located in Kentucky, so you can see a, a big hot spot in Kentucky. Um, but we've had partners on the West Coast and all over. Here's our species um, breakdown, so you can see the different species that have been collected, as well as this other category for every Everything else. Now we do allow um, people to collect data on anything they want, so uh, it doesn't have to be one of the species listed, but in order to be kind of highlighted on that main page, um, you've got to meet those two requirements of having an active research project and engaging with citizen scientists. Uh, so American Chestnut has by far, uh, I think, the most, which is really exciting and interesting because there are so few American Chestnuts around. Um, and you can go and you can look. And I think part of the reason for that success is that they have really taken it up as an organization and made it their own and used it. Um, so these are just a few of the articles that they've written trying to get people to use TreeSnap and how they've incorporated it as a tool in their ongoing programming. So they already had a fantastic way um, to engage people in the research that they were doing. They have a really uh, big network of people doing that. Um, and it's been wonderful working with them and seeing how that's happened. Uh, they also use some of the curation tools like flagging species that aren't American chestnut. They'll, they'll send a little message, this looks like a possible Chinese, need pictures to confirm. Um, so that's been really nice. And we've got lots of other uh, species from ash and hemlock restoration to that white oak project that I mentioned. And that one's been kind of fun because they've had a really active uh, citizen engagement component with people going out and collecting seeds and then they get to track them in the nursery over time and see how well their, their seeds perform. So with that, I think I'm going to uh, wrap up 
my presentation um, so we don't go way over and um, I'll stop sharing. And if anyone has questions, uh, I can answer those now or we can hold them until after. Great, thank you, Ellen. Um, I think if you're going to be able to stick around through the discussion that we can save any kind of more substantive questions to them. But if, if there's anyone on the call that has a kind of clarifying question or something that you wanted to just make, uh, verify before we move on, um, we have time for one question. Otherwise, we'll move on to Jill. Anyone need to ask something? Now? And I would say that I think Meg is on the line as well. And yes. uh, she can answer your questions. Um, she mm -hmm. and um, Abdullah have been involved in several different apps, and uh, I can't overstate how how uh, great it is working with them and their their knowledge and expertise. Uh, so um, yeah, thanks for thanks for having us here today, and let me know if anything comes up. Great, thank you, Ellen, so much. I appreciate it. That was great. Um, so next up, we have uh, Jill Wegerson from. Uh, I have lost my intro slide uh, for, uh, from the University of Connecticut, where she's a bioinformatician, and she is going to just describe how they're using uh, tree snap data and analytics in cartography. Jill, take it away. All right, and everybody can see my slides, okay? Yes. Wonderful. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about an application called Cartography. This is also a web based application, and we specifically interact very closely with TreeSnap and leverage the API that they have developed and integrate this data into an application that's dedicated to uh, genotype, phenotype, and environmental metrics on georeferenced trees. So it's definitely geared towards our uh, scientific community and research community and developing tools to enable a a lot of different questions, especially around forest health. And so I'll just kind of take you through a little bit of that today. And so Ellen just did a great job sort of introducing the TreeSnap mobile application. We leverage that API to regularly import which uh, data from TreeSnap, which is another feature of that application. It's very easy to connect with it and bring that data into different applications as well. And so here's a view of the cartography application. So you see that this is a map-based framework, that we have a lot of georeferenced accessions on there. We have data that comes from a broad range of um, sources. Um, when you first open that application, you see a map summary there. So before you've selected anything, you just have an idea of what that database actually, or what that application is actually serving out in terms of the total number of species, um, the total number of plants, in which case these are almost small trees at this point, and then also the number of studies that are represented there as well. And so here under our tree data set sources, you'll see that uh, TreeSnap is one of the ways that we bring um, these georeferenced and what we call phenotyped accessions, especially if they're one of the species that there's a user community um, built around in TreeSnap, then they are collecting that trait-based information specific to that community through the application, and we can import that data. In addition to that, we're also pulling in data from actual peer-reviewed studies. So these can be any combination of genotype, phenotype, and environment on georeferenced trees. And it can also be from a range of different ty types of studies. So things like common garden, um, trees sampled against the landscape, um, even a growth chamber, greenhouse, all of that can be um, put on the map in different ways and tagged that way through metadata into the application. And so we pull that in through sort of a detailed framework that uh, uh, obtains that metadata on the studies. And in addition to that, we also bring in data from public studies through Dryad. And then we also bring in data through BM as well. And you can turn on and off these data sources as you interact with the application. And so that's seen there. So we recently partnered up with BN as well. So this is a huge network of botanical information and ecology network that's supported through Cyverse. And so we brought in um, almost a million different trees through that application alone, which has a lot of trait data and of course georeference data on those species as well. And so one of the huge advantages of cartography is that we have loaded up several different environmental layers coming from a variety of sources onto the map. And you're able to interact with those, especially at the locations where we have georeferenced tree samples as well. So we have things like soil types, we have world climb data, we have species range maps for many of our um, North American and European species. 
And those are um, accessible through this component of the web. And then for any accession in the application, you're able to actually select that tree. You're able to find out what study that tree came from, what types of traits were assessed for that tree. And you're able to look at the images if those were also collected on the tree at the same time. And so we also use a couple different icons here. We use that purple icon there to indicate things coming from TreeSnap, and we indicate green icons from things coming more or less from sort of peer-reviewed studies. Oops. And so here's another example of using the environmental layer. So here we have land cover, a USGS layer loaded. We can change the transparency. We can load multiple layers in different regions. We can get environmental metrics at any location on the map, depending on sort of the resolution of that particular layer you're working with. And depending on the study, if you select a given tree and it's a more site-based study, you might be looking at multiple trees in one location, or you might be looking at an individual tree, but you're able to determine which of those is the case. And you can also select those trees for downstream analysis. So you can select a single tree or you can select multiple trees at once. And just to uh, show kind of an example of different types of data that we can load in, this week we tried to load in um, some of the FEMC data. So in particular, some of the observations related to winter moth, forest tent caterpillar, and gypsy moth, and we have one of those layers loaded here. And I also showed an example here of a tree snap um, view for American chestnut. And so this is an example of how this would look over here on the map, imported from tree snap. The images are things you can scroll through. You can load that tree up and obtain all of the phenotypic information that was collected and integrate that into downstream analysis. And so here's another example of different environmental layers that you can load up. Here's an example of the forest fragmentation layer. And here's another example of being able to look at a detailed view coming from TreeSnap. For, for one of our ash species as well. And here I wanna highlight the filters. So in addition to being able to load up um, and scroll across and browse the map and load these environmental layers, you can also start to search for specific trait-based information, specific species, certain regions of the world, um, certain studies. And so you can actually load up all the trees meeting those requirements and you can build queries out in that way. And here's another example. Here we're showing the canopy height layer, and we're also showing the ability to start building um, a query through the interface. So here we're looking at traits related to emerald ash borer that were assessed, as well as related to green ash. And then we're able to pull up and view, in, uh, view a specific example, or we would have the option to actually load all of the trees. Or here you can see an example of just loading a specific tree at that location. So one of the key features of cartography in specific, in addition to being able to browse and search and query and collect certain trees, is the ability to analyze the data based on those trees as well. So once you've selected and curated your tree species, you can actually generate a list of those as well as all of the trait-based information on those trees. And you can select them for downstream analysis. Oops, went too far. And you can actually invoke specific workflows to operate on those trees. And this is where a lot of our active development for cartography is right now. And so essentially, this works with another interface known as Galaxy. Most of this is actually behind the scenes for the user, but I just wanted to show a view of what this looks like. We're building essentially informatic workflows to enable things like association genetics, landscape genomics, um, environmental phenotypic associations, and so on. And so for a lot of these tree species, we have a lot of marker information available, microsatellites or SNP data that we can also integrate into these analyses. But we can also just leverage our trait data and our georeference coordinates and, and perform analyses as well. And so the back end of this is building uh, different workflows in order to enable that analysis currently. And so with that, there's just a couple examples of bringing together genotypic and environmental data. And then on the back end, these workflows might look a little bit more complicated, but they're actually enabled through high-performance computing 
um, that we have on the back end of cartography. So that analysis can all be conducted through the web-based interface and is based on data that is coming from sources like TreeSnap, through peer-reviewed studies, through BN observations, and through even external studies that are curated through Dryad. And so that's kind of the complete culmination of the data that's there. And of course, these are gonna range from, in some cases, having genotype data, but in almost all cases, having trait data for those georeferenced accessions. And with that, I think that's my overview of cartography. So if we have any questions now or later, I'm happy to answer those. Great, thank you, Jill. I think um, we'll hold the questions until the end. Uh, at this point, um, please keep your text. I would like to invite um, Shelly Cook to share her screen and turn off her mic or turn on her mic. Uh, Shelly is a database manager with the New York Natural Heritage Program, and she's going to be providing an overview of how. Uh, IMAP Invasives works and how it can support these types of efforts as well. Shelly, take it away. All right, great, thank you. Um, let's see. All right, can you guys see my screen? Yes, we can. Right. I'm trying to get this into slideshow mode. Hold on one second. All right, um, I'm here to talk to you guys today about IMAP Invasives. Um, I um, actually work for NatureServe, um, who uh, we are a we are the one. We have over 80 natural heritage programs in our network um, throughout the United States, Latin America, and Canada. Uh, we have over a thousand conservation professionals within the network, and we do a lot of work with not only in invasive species but uh, rare species and ecosystems as well. We are um, uh, and do a lot of uh, distribution modeling right now. And um, some of you may be familiar with Biotics, which is our uh, rare species uh, software application that we have developed. And one of the projects that I have recently been involved in is IMAP Invasives. Um, IMAP Invasives is an online GIS-based data management system, um, and it's used not only by citizen scientists, but also natural resource professionals. Um, they, we work together to protect our natural resources from the threat of invasive species. And I just kind of wanted to introduce you to some of the user roles that we have. So um, IMAP Invasives is free for anybody to go in and create a basic account. Uh, if you, um, it requires that you sign up, um, but again, that's free. Uh, any individual can go in and can view and create observations. You can uh, download confirmed presence records. You can download all of your records, whether they are confirmed or unconfirmed. And then you can view basic treatment information that's within the system. Then we have um, advanced accounts, uh, which are uh, when you become part of a jurisdiction. So this is kind of when um, fees can be as assessed for not individuals, but we have different jurisdictions. We call them jurisdictions because Canadian, uh, we have a Canadian provinces involved, and so they're not really states. So we consider a jurisdiction um, to be the state or province. Uh, currently, we have eight active jurisdictions that um, participate in monthly calls, um, and they kind of help to guide IMAP um, development throughout um, the development process. So we ask for them for feedback, we meet monthly, um, and we really do have that sense of community that um, people are wanting when it comes to invasive species. Um, if you are part of a participating jurisdiction, then um, you get a little bit more um, ability for some of the added functionality. So that enables you to view detailed treatments in your jurisdiction, create treatments in your jurisdiction, and then download um, your own treatments. And then we also have admin accounts that um, can go in and confirm records by um, individuals within your jurisdiction, um, assign different roles to individuals and uh, jurisdiction members, and then download any records in your geography, including confidential records. Um, 
jurisdiction admins can assign the conf, uh, a confirmer role to anybody in their jurisdiction. So you don't have to be an admin in order to confirm records. Um, but throughout uh, all the different jurisdictions, there are multiple confirmers who can go in and um, confirm records so that um, those records can then be available in our public map. We have a public map view that's available via a web map service um, for public confirmed records, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. You can also um, set up projects that have um, different roles as well, and I think that a project would be a great way to um, kind of collect this uh, tree data. Uh, I wanted to just talk about the types of data that we collect in IMAP. So, we have four basic data types. We have um, the searched area, which is where did you look? We have presence records, what did you find? And then not detected records is what didn't you find? And then treatment records are um, what did you treat? Um, and all of these uh, records can be entered via our um, online interface or via uh, mobile apps, which I will also talk about. So how can IMAP Invasives help with the tree rescue project? So you can report the presence or absence of the pest or pathogen. So a lot of the um, presentations that we've seen today focus on the actual, like the, you would, like the tree. So you'd be reporting a hemlock or a chestnut. Here we actually trust, uh, we track the pest or the pathogen. So um, for instance, you know, we track a hemlock woolly adelgid or emla, uh, emerald ash borer. That's where you would, um, that's what you would report with an IMAP. Obviously, these are on a, on a tree, so you would know that there is a tree was either it had it or didn't have it based on uh, what was reported. You can set custom email alerts when uh, the pest or pathogen or invasive species has been reported in your selected geography. I'll show you some examples of uh, the different email alerts, but this is super important to all the land managers. Um, that participate in our jurisdictions. Uh, it enables them to set um, a variety of email alerts based on any sort of geography or uh, buffer distance from a point. And um, it's uh, one of the most valuable tools that we have with an IMAP. We also have the ability to create on the fly distribution maps of the path of, uh, of your invasive species of interest. Um, you can enter and measure the effectiveness of treatments. And um, again, your, um, in, your input would help land managers and adjacent jurisdictions prepare for the management of these um, invasive species on their lands. I talked a little bit about smartphone and tablet uh, uh, of our mobile apps. Um, IMAP itself is, um, it is like a mobile ready device. So um, when you, open up IMAP Invasives on your browser. It uh, shrinks down to the size of your screen. It's um, completely um, mobile ready. And it, um, the only bad thing about this is that you have to have internet um, connectivity to use it, but it's very handy. Everything you enter goes right back in. So if you're within internet um, connectivity, this is um, one of the best ways that you can enter data. We also have a Survey123 app. Uh, you can enter all of our record types within this uh, presence, not detected, and treatment records. This does work outside connectivity. Um, if you're uh, once you come back into connectivity, your records are uploaded, and its interface mimics that of the online invasives application. Uh, you must be a registered user, but this uh, it's a little bit more. Um, complex of a user interface. It's not quite as straightforward as um, just like entering. You have to have a, it's a little, you have to be a little bit more tech savvy to use it. Then we also have um, just a straight up mobile app that you can get from the Google Play Store or the Android uh, Play Store. And uh, this app only supports presence and not detected records. So it does not um, allow you to enter um, treatment records, but it's a very straightforward, very user-friendly app. You do need to have an um, active IMAP Invasives account to participate. And again, you can use this outside of the GPS um, connectivity. Um, some of the users wanted to have be able to do treatment records, so that's why we um, created the Survey123 app. 
So now I'm going to go ahead and just give you guys a little demo of IMAP. Let's see. All right, so I had a filter here. Um, so when you log into IMAP Invasives, this is the view that you see. These are, um, this is at the hex level. We have um, over a million records in here, so we cannot display all the points that we have at this level, so we, we have to do the hex. Um, over here, we have your layers on and off, so you have your, um, you can, uh, your unconfirmed, not detected, we have approximate records, and then we also have treatment records. It, it takes a little bit to load because we do have quite a bit of data. Um, you can uh, filter records, you can create, I'll, I'll run you through creating a record, um, use the find tool, um, filter, and so I just thought that I would um, show a quick demo on, um, we'll just do hemlock, hemlock woolly adelgid. So if you apply the filter, it should just take a second. Um, it'll filter down the data to where we have locations. Um, I happen to know, because I did a little bit of research, that some of these are around Letchworth State Park in New York. And so if you zoom into these locations, then eventually you'll get to see the confirmed, the hexes will go off and you'll see the confirmed locations. So in this instance here, you can see that we have a variety of confirmed, I can, I'll turn these on and off. So all of the green dots here are all confirmed um, hemlock woolly adelgid locations. You can click on any of these and get information on um, the condition of the, um, uh, you can find out the survey information on each one of these. So for our presence record here, um, you can enter as, as much or as little information as you want. So, um, you know, number found, uh, whether um, it was found alive, all of the different information here on, um, you know, on that individual um, species. If you go back to the map, um, again, those were uh, that confirmed presence records. There's some unconfirmed presence records there. We have, um, these are areas that they looked and they found healthy trees. So you can um, click on those and find out information on those areas where they um, looked but didn't find it. And then um, these are some areas where treatments were applied. And so um, again, you can click on an individual record and then get into and get information on the treatments that were applied. You can open up the treatment records and get information on what kind of treatment uh, was applied. And if it was a chemical, you can find out what chemical was applied and all of that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> Uh, one of the cool things I think about IMAP is um, if you zoom back out, um, I mentioned um, the distribution layers. So you can say, um, show me the distribution of this particular species. Um, you can do it by county or district, um, hydro basin, any of these different um, if you wanted to see what the distribution of hemlock woolly adelgid was um, by watershed, um, you can easily do that on the fly and then you can save that um, to your layers and then you can create, you can layer them on top of each other so that if you wanted to, um, so this was HWA, you can save this and then you can uh, clear that and then you can do um, emerald, Oops, that's the wrong one. I need to do it here. You can apply a filter. And that should just take a second. And then you can choose a different color. Um, and you can show the distribution layer here. And now you have your EAB and you can save that. And 
Um, now you've got all of these saved down here in your distribution layers, and you can mess with the transparencies and turn them on and off. So it's kind of a cool way to be able to see on the fly real time distribution of these species. Um, we have a variety of reports that you can also run. Um, you can, we have approaching regions so that you can, um, uh, it, re, it di displays a list of species based on presence records that are not found within um, your selected geography, but are found within a specified distance of um, of a buffer that you apply. So you can draw your area of interest and then you say, I wanna know what's coming that's not currently in my area within a certain amount of miles or kilometers. Um, we also have an area treated report. So um, you can find information on the total areas that were um, treated uh, via the treatment records. And um, then to complement that, we have an infested area report that displays the invested area based on presence records. Um, so you can kind of combine the tr area treated uh, with the infested area to find out the effectiveness of treatments, which has been extremely helpful for land managers to know um, if their treatments are actually working. Um, let's see here. Um, I wanted to just show you, um, actually, I'm going to switch to um, this is the dev server because I don't want to set an email alert on a real um, account and get alerts. So each individual can um, set up um, email alerts. This one, so you just come up here and say add, um, add alerts. You can um, name it anything you want. You can select your frequency, daily, weekly. Um, you can choose to um, get alerted on new only new records or confirmed records and then so you can say you know you can go down to the genus or you can specify um, any name that you want so you can say by geography type um, so if you wanted to do if you wanted to know emerald ash borer and then you could say by county watershed any of the things that we currently track and then so oh that was country um county was up here somewhere um so you could have it on county or you could have it on your state um spotted lanternfly has been a big one that a lot of people have been very interested in um so we have again a lot of land owners uh, or a lot of land managers um use these on a regular basis um, and then you can go down, you can select buffers. Um, and I also mentioned that you can do radius from a point or first time in a specific county or district. So um, these are um, highly used by um, all of our participating jurisdictions. And then I was just gonna show you super quickly um, how easy it is to um, create a record. Um, let's see, I'll just zoom in. I'm going to just scroll over because I tend to put in a lot of um, points around my house <laughs> for testing purposes. Um, I'm just going to wait for this to load really quick. Um, and sometimes the dev server is a little bit slower than the other ones, but I, if I create a record on our production server, then it sends off a whole bunch of email alerts and I get people upset with me. Let's see. Do, do, do. Uh, let's see, maybe I'll just come over to our production server. I'll just do a test record here. We have a fake species that I can test. I don't know why it's taking so long on the dev server. Okay, here we go. All right, so create a record. You can choose your presence, treatment or not detected. If you don't have access to treatment, you wouldn't see it here. Um, a multi-record searched area is if you are doing, um, if you're actively doing a survey, you can create um, treatment, not detected and presence records all at the same time. But for just a citizen scientist who just wants to create a quick record, you can create points, polygons, or lines, but if I just wanted to do a quick point, um, you can add a buffer or not add a buffer around it. 
you would um, select your species. Um, again, emerald ash borer. It knows who you are. It knows the date. Um, if you want to select a project, you can add a project to it. You can upload um, a photo here. And then if you want to add more advanced details, um, you can add this information here. It, this information will change whether you're putting in a plant or animal or insect, um, so it's smart enough to know um, what type of um, record you're entering. Um, but if you don't want to, you can just hit next and complete your record, and it's it's just that easy. Um, we it can be you can enter as much information as you want or as little as you want so um, the land managers and those that are doing extensive surveys will tend to enter more information whereas citizen scientists who are just trying to enter presence absence can just kind of fly right through it um, then you can go and look at your um, you can go look at your information uh, and you can edit your record and here you can also add more information. So um, that's kind of the quick and whirlwind tour of IMAP. Um, I'm not sure where I am on time, but I'm sure I'm pretty close to 15 minutes. So um, yeah, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you guys have when it comes time to. Great, thank Great. you so thank much, you so Shelley. Much, Shelley. And and my sincere my apologies for uh, failing your affiliation. I apologize for that. Um, I was with Heritage Programs for 18 years. So I was with the New York Natural Heritage Program for over 10 years. So it could be, and I was with the Idaho for five years. So I've been with the Heritage Network for 20 years now. So yeah, I think my Googling <laughs> failed me. So that's okay. But I have <laughs> and, and have heavily involved with them. So no worries. Great. Well, thank you for the whirlwind. That was a great tour of IMAP invasives <laughs> and I think a good complement to what we saw from, like, as you mentioned, the kind of tree-based observations to the um, pest pathogen-based observations. Yep. Um, finally, I want to uh, invite Nathaniel Sharp. He is with the Vermont Center for Eco Studies, and when I was browsing his iNaturalist record uh, scape, he is very active, so I think we're fortunate to have him uh, subbing in for me, and not, and I'm not going to give a presentation on iNaturalist, so I'm going to invite Nathaniel to share with us what he's learned about iNaturalist and how it might relate to these efforts. Uh, Nathaniel, please go ahead. All right, thanks so much. Let me just get up this screen sharing. And, and Nathaniel, just so you know, you can take about the 10 minutes that we had talked about, so um, okay. just feel free to Sounds take good. the time that you have. All right. So is that showing now? Yes. Okay, excellent. All right. So just really quickly for those who aren't familiar with iNaturalist, it is basically a massive um, worldwide community science project um, available both as an app and as a website where people can upload photos of any sort of form of life or even evidence of life, such as animal tracks or the tracks of like a um, bark mining beetle or something on a tree. And iNaturalist um, has an artificial intelligence system which will look at, the, look at those photos and can provide ID suggestions for what it thinks is in that photo based on time of year, location, and what the photo looks like. So for most people, that is what iNaturalist is used for, is you see something, you want to know what it is, and you upload it. But if you really want to dig into that data, which is enormous, there's um, several, uh, I can't remember how many, um, I think there's 1.2 million iNaturalist users and several million observations. Just within the state of Vermont, there's almost, there's, um, almost half a million observations. There's a lot of people that are providing data. And if you really want to get into that data and play around with it, there's a lot of different ways that you can do that, which I'll be going over today. So the, the sort of most, um, uh, visible of those is the projects. So in iNaturalist, you can create a project that has a specific focus. So an example project I'm using here is leaf miners of North America. So this has a geographic focus as well as sort of a taxonomic focus of leaf mining insects. And when you create a project, there are certain rules you can add. So you can say, I only want observations from North America of this taxa of insects or observations from Pennsylvania of these two tree species, for example. And then iNaturalist gathers all of this onto a page where you can provide updates, you can have little journal posts, you can update people on how the project is going, and then you can see all of this data, such as um, how many observations have been contributed to the project, how many species have been observed through this project, and how many people you're engaging through this project. 
Then you can also go through all of this data and see what the most commonly observed species is, whether you're looking at plants or insects or both. You can see what species are being most frequently observed in your area. You can also see how many people are contributing observations and who are those power users that are really contributing a lot. And then you can also see who is identifying observations. So a big part of iNaturalist is it's not just the artificial intelligence that's helping you identify something. It's the entire iNaturalist community that can browse through iNaturalist. And this is something I do a lot in areas that I'm familiar with, such as birds and insects and other things like that, is I'll go through observations that people have posted and either um, bring their genus ID up to species if I'm familiar with that species or agree with someone's species ID to make it, quote, research grade, which means that more than uh, one person has agreed on that observation that this is that species or this genus or this family. And then that is um, available for community scientists, scientists to download through GBIF and also through iNaturalist. So you can also map all of these observations with iNaturalist, either through your project or through filtering, which I'll get into later. But you can actually look at all of these observations on a map and see where all of these leaf miner observations are coming in from across North America, along with the little um, handy thing over here on the right where you can see what the latest updates to the project are. So you can see these observations coming in in real time and then look at them on a map and zoom in and play around with them to your heart's content. So something uh, I, get a lot, I get a lot of questions about with iNaturalist is what if I'm posting an observation of a threatened species or a sensitive species, or I'm just photographing a tree in my backyard and I don't want that information available to the public. You are in complete control of, control of, control of, how, of how, and iNaturalist is also in control of that a little bit. So iNaturalist has a database collected through NatureServe and through the Fish and Wildlife Service and a bunch of other databases of vulnerable or endangered or threatened species that it automatically obscures. So when I look at this photo of a wood turtle that I have not taken, I see it as this randomized blue point in this big blue box. So it doesn't mean that this was observed at that point. It just means that within this 20 kilometer square block, square box, someone observed a wood turtle. So that means that if I'm a poacher, someone is looking for these turtles, I don't get that information. Or if you just wanna um, sort of hide the location of your house where you're contributing lots of observations from, when you're uploading an observation, you can switch it to obscured and say, I just want this to be obscured. I don't want those location coordinates to be out there in the world. Speaking of location coordinates, when you're uploading something to iNaturalist, you can actually have complete control of the accuracy. So there's this little sliding scale thing here you can do where if you're standing out in a field observing a tree and you can see on Google Maps where exactly that tree was, you can shrink this accuracy circle to be two or three meters. Or if you were out in the middle of nowhere and you're not sure how accurate your GPS signal was and you can't really see like in the big forest on the map where exactly you were, you can make that accuracy circle a little bigger to reflect how sure you are that that's exactly where that was observed. So I should mention also that iNaturalist can work without an, um, an internet signal. So if you're just sort of out wandering around and you take a photo, you can't upload it to iNaturalist right there in the middle of the woods if you don't have service but you can take that photo, head back home, upload it, and all that GPS information, all of that um, date and time location will be in the metadata of that photo. So I mentioned filters earlier. This might look like a lot, but once you sort of go through it section by section, it makes sense. There's, um, so this is the filters that you can access through that big iNaturalist map where you can really start to get at the, the meaty data that you want. So you can look at, um, you can have it selected to show species that have been verified as research grade, you can search for threatened species. You can search for just your observations or observations with photos, observations of species that um, are marked as introduced. You can search by tags, which is something that users can add to their observations when they upload them. So you, you just have a tag for like insects 2020, just so you can keep all of those in one spot. You can use that tag and search by that. You can also search by users, by project, by certain places, and you can search um, on time scale, so you can search by an exact date, a range of dates, a certain month. Um, and then you can also sort by date added or the date they were observed, things like that. So and, uh, when I was mentioning projects earlier, this is something that any iNaturalist user can create. Um, pretty much every iNaturalist user has access to the maps they have access to. They can agree or disagree with other people's observations and provide reasoning why for that. And they can also create projects. So if you are an iNaturalist user who's just curious about something, you can create a project. Or if you are an organization that is looking at a, accessing a certain amount of data, you can create a project to more handily access that. So you can do that 
by creating a project and creating rules for that. So you can say, I only want to look at these specific taxa in this specific place. And you can even say, I only want observations from these specific users. So if you're working with people who you know are on iNaturalist and you don't want to include any other observations besides theirs, you can limit that to just those users. Or you can leave it completely open to the public and say, just I want every observation of Emerald Ash Borer and Hemlock Woolly Delgid that take place in New Hampshire and Vermont, for example. And that will gather all of those data into one project. So you can also add a few more sort of layers on top of that. So this is a project that we run at the Vermont Center for Eco Studies called the Vermont Lady Beetle Atlas. And this goes into a little more detail. So you can add more project rules where you can say that every time someone submits an observation to this project, it would be really helpful if they could fill out this little form. So we have all of these um, uh, places where, you could, where a user can input data and um, this sort of screen is prompted every time they upload an observation to our project. So they get this little notification saying, hey, that's great that you saw this lady beetle. Can you add any more information here? That would be really helpful to the project. And then we can sort by all that information later. We can search through those observation fields, which are also able to be created by iNaturalist users. So there's already a host of observation fields. Here's just a small example of some. There's interactions between two organi organisms. There's reading bird codes, there's voucher specimen taken, there's host plan ID, lady beetle habitat for that project. So if you don't see an observation field that works for your project, you can create your own and you can create either a drop down menu of possible options for that observation field, or you can create just sort of a blank box where people can write in information there. So then you can also search by these observation fields. So if you want to look up all the observations that have a observation field of host plan ID for Joe Pie weeds for this example, you can immediately get a map of all of the observations that iNaturalist users have noted as um, being a be, um, sort of being a parasite or something on that that species. And you can do that with every single observation field. So whichever one fits best with your project, you can immediately access all of that data once people have used that observation field. You can also do the same thing with tags. So if you have um, a specific tag for a project that you'd just like people to say, hey, if you are aware of this project and want to add data to it, just tag us in it. So just um, have an agreed upon phrase or something where you can tag, where people can tag that, and then you can search by that tag and immediately get all that, that information. This is a tag that I've created for myself that I find kind of helpful and interesting for iNaturalist first finds in Vermont. So these are all species that I've found in Vermont that have no other iNaturalist records, which is Something that iNaturalist is really powerful with is finding those new and um, unfamiliar species or populations, just because there's so many people out there observing that if you just sort of browse through those observations sometimes, you'll find some really interesting discoveries. And then there's a whole lot more I can get into with iNaturalist that I'd be happy to answer more questions after this um, presentation, but also I just want to direct you to the iNaturalist help page as a whole drop down menu for managing projects. So if you're interested in iNaturalist and want to know how you can dive deeper into that data, you can go through managing projects, this um, handy tool here that shows you what kind of project might be most helpful and then sort of guide you through the um, process of creating a project. So again, feel free to ask me any questions, tag me on iNaturalist at N Sharp or uh, reach out to me at my email here. Thanks very much. Great, thank you, Nathaniel. That was a great overview as well. Um, so I uh, invited this time, first of all, I want to thank all of our presenters. Um, this has been one of the more informative webinars that I've been on in a long time, and I really appreciate uh, the time and, and succinct uh, overviews you've provided. Um, I want to open it up first to just ask if there are any questions that participants have or other presenters have of each other, um, any questions uh, that people want to ask. And you can use the chat box to raise hand or just turn on your mic. I'm always going to give that off. OK, um, so assuming that there are no clarifying questions to start, um, just coming back to some of those questions to consider. So we've heard a lot of. Uh, several different ways that we can get people out collecting information with these tools um, and they all as I've been watching it they have there's power in using something that's more specific and then there's flexibility in using something less specific um, and we have 
kind of a number of tools that are uh, lining up in terms of capacity and in terms of their focus. So I'm guess uh, thinking back to our initial kind of charge in doing this webinar was around the ability to track and share information. Are there are there things that we still cannot do that we need to be able to do? Um, I think all of these tools could be used to collect and store field data that um, we're capturing, but is there anything that we're still not able to do um, when we're thinking specifically about threatened tree species in the Northeast and their conservation and preservation? Any thoughts on this topic? Anything we need to be looking for or, or thinking about how to do better? So to uh, some of our presenters, I guess maybe I'll go back to, um, I guess I'll open this up to our presenters and ask uh, Ellen or Shelley or Jill or Nathaniel, um, what, what do you see as the next step? Like you, there are all these great tools that are being built to collect information and some, and cartography I think shows how you can pull in multiple different data sources into one platform for analysis. But um, what do you see as like the best practice going forward if we're going to have someone out there trying to collect information on trees that um, is, are there ways that we can look at feeding one source of data into the other? Do we need something like cartography that pulls together these multiple sources so the user can pick their thing and then uh, feed it into a larger discussion? I'm curious in your presenter, from our presenters, any thoughts on like what you see as where we should be going in terms of synthesizing all this great data that's being collected. Um, this is Shelley. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, yeah, I, I think that this is one of the biggest challenges that um, we that we face. Um, we do make our data available through a web map service, like I said. Um, one of the things that we would love to be able to do is to bring in other data alongside our data. I know we're very interested in iNaturalist data. Um, we're currently working with iNaturalist to um, kind of come up with maybe an agreement where we could um, kind of get each other's data on some sort of a regular um, exchange service of some sort. We've also worked with um, you know, Bison um, and uh, USGS NAS and EdMaps to try and get everybody on the same sort of um, playing field in terms of making all of these data, what we call kind of the big four or five available so that we can um, share this data, especially when it comes to invasive species data. Like this is not the type of data where you want to keep it close to you. You know, this is really important for um, the, you know, our natural world to be able to share the these species. Um, but it is hard because we're also competitors in some way, right? So trying to get that balance between um, public data that is easily shared among various platforms, I think is something that um, we are kind of, wor we're working towards. We've made our stuff publicly available. You can go to imapinvasives.org and um, there's a section on there on our web map services and so that you can get all of our public data uh, available to bring into your system. And we would love to be able to get other data to be able to bring in a, alongside ours, um, at least to be able to view on the screen and compare where those locations are and where the gaps might be missing and things like that. Thanks, Shelley. Um, Jill, um, yeah, I was going to say, I think, you know, some of the, the big challenges are exactly that. It's still on the data integration side. Um, something we spend a lot of time doing that I didn't talk about was a lot of sort of standardizing measurements, standardizing traits, standardizing how we describe um, different disease states or growth um, records or phenology or different things that people are measuring in the forest. So that when you come into a platform that's collecting data from a lot of different sources, can you actually share and integrate that? So we do a lot of, uh, or spend a lot of time sort of curating that information and mapping it onto what we call ontologies in order to make that data more accessible. Um, and then also I think a lot of in, when thinking about the environmental layers and thinking about how to display 
different types of data that are being collected regionally as well as globally is also increasingly looking at things like LIDAR and other um, things that are being used to assess forest health and disease um, and how to integrate those effectively and efficiently through web-based platforms. Um, so I think that's a huge area um, that, we're, that we're trying to do with some of the current funding that we have through cartography. Um, so I think those areas specifically um, are directions um, that are needed for the current research and also just to improve that integration so that you can look at things. And the other aspect um, as well relates to sort of just this idea of citizen science collections, right? That there is going to be some error in, um, you know, some people are going to be more knowledgeable or less knowledgeable about things they upload. So the ability to sort of have some, you know, automated curation on that, the ability to also at least tell the scientists, you know, what is a peer-reviewed study, um, what is a BN observation, what is a, you know, tree snap observation, and so on. Um, so there's there's been huge improvements and advancements in, in what um, image recognition can do, but it isn't 100%. And so thinking about those things, I think, are still areas that um, exist as challenges as well. Thank you, Jill. I think one of the things that comes to mind to me is I think um, you all pointed out some really uh, important things in terms of the technology and the future of that and where it's going. And something that um, I think comes a lot uh, comes up a lot with us is kind of making sure that for whatever it is that you're doing and kind of the way that you envision collecting, uh, managing, and uh, analyzing data that the system that you're using is matched to that and kind of meets the needs of your, you know, those collecting the data, of those analyzing the data, that it talks to um, the different kind of analysis programs that you're using. And I think that all of these are fantastic tools. You know, I use iNaturalist all the time and love it. Um, and I think it just kind of depends on what you are doing and what you want to do with that. And that these aren't necessarily mutually exclusive because you could have them incorporated in different parts of your data collection as long as they're all uh, feeding data into the same uh, database uh, where you can then have those uh, downstream analyses um, more streamlined. Um, I mean, there's going to be differences in the types of data that's collected, uh, but maybe they could be uh, useful in different aspects of what you're doing. Great. Thank you, Ellen. Um, I have a question in the chat from Jeff Garnet, who I think believe had to drop off, but he said, are there specific efforts to fill in the gaps, quote unquote, in terms of less visited areas? Uh, could the geocaching community perhaps be motivated to go out of the way places where records are sparse? Any kind of, so this is on the more like the uh, the people side of this, how, are, how can you use these tools to motivate some uh, collection where we're missing information? I would say that like at least with the tree snap perspective this kind of highlights something that tree snap like the role of tree snap and then what is not you know tree snap able to do so tree snap is like a platform that you could use and you could engage um citizen science or uh, professional scientists groups with but um you know, historically, we've done more outreach with our particular partner organizations uh, to assist with what they're doing. But at this point, what we're really focused on is just making that tool uh, accessible to people. And then it would be really up to um, those using it to think really critically about where are they getting data from? Is it meeting their research objectives? Is it meeting their outreach objectives? Um, rather than kind of a, a package deal. Um, and of course, TreeSnap uh, is free. So <laughs> that's part of it too, is that we really don't have um, people who are out doing that kind of work. Uh, we'll make it as easy as possible for them to use it and you to access it. But um, it's kind of more on just presenting in the, uh, this platform for you to use. And Meg, feel free to correct me if I'm missing anything. And Ellen, if I can follow up on that, because you mentioned you have partners. Um, and sorry, Meg, I'll I'll come back. I'll yield space. But you mentioned you had partners. Um, have you seen any of them? I mean, you showed some of the snaps from uh, American Chestnut Foundation, where they're encouraging their user community to kind of take this out into their spaces and and mobilize them to get out and do more collection. Um, any other examples from partners like akin to that, where they've said like, oh, we really need to know how much in these upper uh, headwaters, uh, how much 
HWA we're seeing or how much hemlock we're seeing. Has that kind of been happening? Like, do you see your partners picking up that charge of filling in these gaps? Yeah, where it's successful, that definitely happens. So that's that's the cases where it's successful is where our partners are really engaged and getting people out there to do things like TACF, um, like our new oak genetics program, uh, like many of our Pacific Madrone partners, um, like the Florida Torreya groups, you know, they're passionate about finding these species and um, preserving them. Uh, and that's where that's where it's been great. Um, I think where it's more of a struggle is if, you know, people want to get this data, but they have no plan in terms of how to mobilize people on the ground to collect that, because that's not something that um, without funding or something we can really assist with. Um, but uh, we want to make the tool as easy to use um, for whoever wants to use it. If that makes sense, does that answer your question or anything else you wanted to add, Meg? Nope, that was perfect. You hit all the all the highlights I was gonna gonna say as well. <laughs> and Meg has been partnering with some other apps and user groups on kind of different uh, scenarios of collecting data, analyzing it um, that she could. Uh, certainly talk on uh, to give you an idea of like the scope of that. Um, but for most of our tree snap users, um, I think things are really successful when they have passionate groups that they're working with um, and just needed that extra piece of technology to kind of um, they might not have the GIS abilities or the uh, programming abilities to or maybe they do and they just this is easy for them to be able to run with and go. Yeah, I was going to say another um area for TreeSnap too is it's it's being used also just as a, a, a research tool directly, right? So scientists actually using it for their trait collection or to use it with students who are trained, but also so they have these set screens in front of them that are custom to their study so that they can kind of quickly go through and put that information in. Um, and we've been running sort of competitions on the cartography side, so more for scientists to actually bring in their peer-reviewed studies, um, which has been really successful as well. So things like that, um, you can kind of mobilize people. And there's a leaderboard, right, for TreeSnap, for example, and you can kind of see how people are doing. But um, scientists could go out and say, yeah, it's because that's always a problem with citizen science apps. I think that's always one of the challenges is it's um, people tend to track things near where they live, um, where they visit, right? They kind of talk about that with um, eBird that they were missing, right? A lot of data on birds that, you know, were out at different times, um, uh, nocturnal times and things like that. So they were, you know, had gaps in their data. So you can kind of say, okay, you know, this is what we need and, and get a community motivated. But it's, it's about the community level, like uh, Ellen mentioned. So, yeah. And I think that points out something else good is that citizen science or uh, tree snap is best for groups who, um, if they're not professional scientists, they're pretty engaged. Like they're pretty knowledgeable about those species. Um, you know, you're probably not just going to stumble onto an American chestnut. Um, or if you did, you might not know what it was. Um, versus some of the questions that I think if you had, um, you know, the more data you're collecting, the better. And it's uh, kind of just uh, um, more observational of what are you seeing where, and there aren't those follow up questions associated with it, like really detailed parameters that our partners wanted, um, there might be some better choices for that. Uh, so just kind of uh, my two cents on um, there's no kind of one single right solution. It just depends on how you want to uh, manage your program. Great, thank you. Um, how uh, I guess I should I'm gonna stop monopolizing the question and answer. Um, are there other folks who have uh, questions from the participant list? Um, anyone else want to kind of chime in with a thought or uh, something that jumped out at you? All right, then it's back to me. Um, so a question that kind of has been percolating in my mind, I think this has been one of the powers of IMAP and VASIS, as I've seen, is the, the, the absence information, the search area and lack of observation. And I think it kind of tails into Jeff's question, like if we're thinking about what the, the distribution of threatened species are in areas and how do we get a record of that, um, has, has TreeSnap or iNaturalist had uh, has that been something that you've talked about, kind of what your like search or how you detote, um, can define non-observation? 
I can see that for iNaturals, we're very focused on particular trees um, or plant species. You know, that's the focus. And it's not, you know, emerald ash borer, it's the ash trees. Um, now, there are ways to um, track, you know, the absence of emerald ash borer damage and the absence of treatments or something like that. But it's very tree focused, um, not on the uh, absence side of things. Um, kind of and not really intended to be used from a monitoring perspective on like whether trees are there or not. It's about reporting individual trees of interest, I'd say. Um, does that sound right to you, Meg? And I know you've been working on some other things that add that capability or similar ones. Um, and I should say that everything that we're talking about with TreeSnap is in its current form. Uh, and um, things can be changed and we certainly have changed things for groups in the past. Um, particularly if funds are available to support our developer time on that. Yeah, we've been working on an app that's doing more plot level monitoring, which is would be, you know, the gold standard of trying to see how these species are um, evolving over time and is regeneration happening. Um, but that that requires citizen scientists who are very committed to going out every year and monitoring these plots. So that's been really fascinating, but a totally different different use case. And we're also working with um, with Jill and Ellen with a timber tracking network where they're going out and doing focused sampling of areas where they, they need to um, get an idea of the species. Um, and it's, it's more to combat timber fraud is the use case there. But again, like targeted areas where they know they wanna go in and sample, we have a separate app for that. Um, but yeah, I think I think TreeSnap probably fits what you wanna do best because, it, if you're training your user groups that I want healthy trees as well as infested trees, then hopefully you're getting a nice broad overview of where you have problems and where you don't have problems. Yeah, and one of the um, aspects of, I'm thinking about ash in specific, because that's one of the ones that TreeSnap has sort of a nice um, kind of walkthrough of canopy health and images there where you can indicate what's going on. And since when we say import a lot of that information into cartography and we're trying to map those, you know, things onto standardized, you know, um, nomenclature, if there's peer reviewed studies also out there tracking this information, all of that gets integrated with the TreeSnap observations. Um, and you can actually search just healthy, you know, trees that have, you know, uh, some level of emerald ash borer infestation, and you can actually search that through the app or just show those trees or monitor it that way. So when we actually pull some of that data in, we can do some new things with it as well. Great, thank you. Um, any other, anyone else want to ask a question? I think we're about out of time. Um, any other questions from folks on the call? Uh, Matthias? That one from Matthias, yeah. Yeah, um, just a clarifying question. Uh, one of the components to tree snap, or uh, so you need to be part of a project and have a citizen science component, it sounded like. Um, to start a project, is that as simple as naming something, or do you need to be verified? How does that work? You don't need to be verified. Um, so we have a PDF form basically for adding a new tree. Um, so if you're already using one of the trees that we have profiled, then no problem. You can take it and start using it today. Um, similarly, if um, you want to use a species that's not listed, one of the others, you can list it as an other and use it right now. Um, but if you want to have a tree species profiled on kind of that front page that has its own um, paired questions associated with it. Uh, that's when we ask um, for information about it. So some background information, some educational information, some photos, its distribution um, that we can put that um, in the app. We also ask that you give us a list of the questions that you really want to know about it. What are the detailed questions that you need answered for your research mission? Um, and we'll work with you to kind of make that app friendly because sometimes I know myself, you know, uh, I'm not an app uh, person. I'm not, I'm, I don't have that wonderful insight into what's going to be user friendly. Uh, I'm, I'm a tree uh, person and a, a forest health specialist. So I'll like come up with these really long winded questions that like answer everything I want. And then it's like, oh, this would never work in the app form and people would be exhausted by it. Um, so we'll work together with you to try to figure that out. Um, but uh, then the, the third thing is that we want to know, and it's not like we're going to, to check or anything, but we want to know that there's a clear research mission for the data that's being collected and that there's a clear plan 
to engage um, a broad group in collecting that data. Because if there aren't those two components, there are probably better um, apps and solutions for what you're doing. It's not that you can't use CreeSnap for that. You know, I use it all the time just to kind of uh, basically like my own uh, GPS device in the field for like points that I want to be keeping track of and trees or uh, plants that I want to be keeping track of. Um, we don't mind that at all. That's great for you to use it for whatever you want. But if you're going to be kind of profiled on it, especially for a new species, we just want to see that you're doing those two things because otherwise um, there, there are probably better ways to accomplish what you're doing. Yeah, and once you're a recognized organization, like we don't do any gatekeeping of users. Your users are going to be able to sign up and they can contribute to any species and they can log. And I'm sure we have users that haven't learned about it through our partner organizations that have stumbled on it in the app store or have seen a random presentation and picked it up. Um, so we don't we don't do any gatekeeping at the user level. But it is if you tell the people you want to engage about it, you're going to get more observations that are relevant to what you what type of data you want to collect. So I don't know yeah. if that helps. Like and once you're, say, in, you're there, that anybody can sign up. <laughs> like I, I wouldn't expect you to get a whole lot of observations about what you're interested in unless you've got some kind of program where you're getting people involved and using TreeSnap because TreeSnap, you know, that's it's got this specific use to do that. Um, whereas like iNaturalist, I'm, I'm just gonna. Uh, point to iNaturalist and Nathaniel, you can correct me. I mean, you know, I've used it for citizen science and research projects in the past where like I want everybody's data and I don't care if they were taking a picture of something else, you know, like I want to know exactly where honeysuckle leaf blight is and I want to get a, a distribution map and they might not know me or even know that I'm like uh, using their data, um, but it's just this fantastic resource for like the presence of, you know, do I see those symptoms on the leaf that I'm really interested in because I want to know about the distribution of this fungus and this pathogen. Um, and I mean, so many people use iNaturalist that uh, they don't have to know about my project. <laughs> I mean, I did go through all the traditional networks, you know, emailing every master naturalist group in the eastern United States or within the distribution of the species that I was interested in. Um, so that's good. But I think probably a lot of the observations had nothing to do with that and were just people that were using iNaturalist of their, you know, own accord. Of course, they're not answering like the detailed questions that that I have about it because I don't. I just want to kind of get a sense of where the distribution is so I can follow up with them later. Um, and so that's been fantastic. And I wouldn't use TreeSnap that same way because I think if I just put something on there and then didn't do anything to engage people to do it, you wouldn't get the observations that you want. Um, and uh, feel free to correct me on iNaturalist if you'd like. Uh, so, but just wanted to kind of point out that difference in, in how uh, I've seen Great, thanks. Well, um, I guess Nathaniel, did you want to jump in there or? No, that sounds, yeah, that sounds um, like a lot of the ways that I've heard similar people use iNaturalist. We have a project with um, BC for uh, looking for native bees and a lot of the species that are completely new to the state that we've been out searching for and like encouraging volunteers to go out searching for were just found by people who found a bee in their garden and thought, oh, that looks, that looks neat and it's a first date record. So that's yeah. something that iNaturalist is really, really useful in finding. It's so cool and I use it a lot. So I do extension programming and like outreach. And so a lot of what I do is trying to make people aware of invasive plants, for example, um, you know, that they're a problem. And then they're like, okay, is this, is this, what is this? And what is that? And what is that? And it's like, they send me a ton of emails and I'm like, oh no, hey, there's this great app that you can use instead. And um, it might not always be right, but it's a really good resource. And the data um, that you collect there on invasive species might be pipelined to some other invasive species databases. Um, and I think it's just great uh, for that um, use. Uh, and yeah, I, TreeSnap doesn't do any automatic identification of photos. So you better know that you have a hemlock or a uh, ash or a chestnut. Um, if you don't, we have some resources, but it's not the same thing. And I think it really shapes when it would be successful uh, versus when iNaturalist or something else might be a better choice. Great, well, I wanna thank all of you for your time and effort. This has been extremely informative and I appreciate the, the willingness to have this discussion afterwards too. Um, so we'll be making this recording available um, and I'll be following up with all of your presenters just to check on that. But um, provided that we get permission, then we'll have this up and available. So if there's others you couldn't join that you think would benefit from hearing this information, please send it along. <clears throat>
excuse me. Um, so with that, we'll close the webinar. Uh, thank you, Ellen. Thank you, Shelley. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Nathaniel. Um, and thank you, Meg, for joining and adding in too. Um, and we look forward to kind of next steps and seeing where this effort takes us. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. you too. Bye. Thanks, everyone.